I'm Mark Mandel, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here tonight for this second Are You Listening session of the BSO's 2012-13 season. I'm delighted to have with me our assistant principal base, Lawrence Wolf, whom I will address as Larry, and who will smile at you frequently while not speaking. Um, <laughs> Yes, our relationship has gotten closer and closer over the years because we have the same birth date, although we were not born in the same year. And he, he stays ahead of me in that regard. Um, so welcome again, thanks for being here tonight. So with that, what I wanna do is start with just a little bit of music relevant to our discussion of symphony versus concerto, and then we'll see what happens after that, which is a way that I enjoy proceeding quite frequently, as some of you may know by this point. So here's just the beginning of a piece of music that I think will be familiar. <laughs> okay. We don't need more of that than this for now. Um, who thought that was a symphony? <laughs> and anyone think it might have been a concerto? How do we know that that was a symphony versus a concerto? Any thoughts about that? Okay. Yes, well, well yes. I, I, what did you say? I'm sorry to listen to the laugh from Larry here. It is called a symphony, yes. Those of you who know that music know probably that it is Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 5. That is always a good hint if you've got nothing else. Um, the woman sitting up here in front mentioned that we know it's a symphony because we did not hear a concerto soloist. On the other hand, the relevant question there would be, but how would we know that a concerto soloist isn't going to enter at a certain point? And, and that's a very interesting take on this whole matter, and it's a take that I actually want to pursue a little bit as the session proceeds. Um, what I want to do now, having found that pretty much all of you recognize the Beethoven Fifth Symphony as a symphony, um, is just look for a moment at this handy dandy little sheet that I've brought in for you tonight. Because what I've done here is included the composer names, piece titles, and movement listings, as well as dates of composition as such, of the music that I will be drawing upon in this discussion tonight. And I set it up in a way that I must admit struck me as pretty clever by the time it was done <laughs> because I didn't actually start out this way. I started out having all of the pieces down in a single column, but then when I realized that I couldn't make it work on a single sheet that way, I opted for the two column format, added in another piece that wasn't originally on the piece of paper because I thought it would be useful, and then realized that I could actually line up the Beethoven and Dvorak symphonies with one another across the two columns. And similarly, I was able to line up the Shostakovich and Britain violin concertos across the two columns. And this already provided a basis for drawing some interesting parallels. Um, you all see that the Beethoven and the Dvorak each have four movements. Movements are the names we give to the large sections of a piece of music that combine to make a bigger overall piece. So a symphony typically comes in four movements. I think this is something that I've mentioned here before. And dating back to the time of Mozart's mature symphonies and Haydn's main symphonies, they tend to come in four movements in a sequence, fast, slow, dance, movement, fast. Is this news to anyone here? It's fine if it is. And that's one of the reasons I'm going through this because I never assume that everyone knows everything. So a symphony is a work for orchestra, typically in the classical and romantic periods in these four sections that I have just defined as movements. And you'll see also on the list of paper that they have Italian words attached to them, which basically tell us the speed at which the music is to move. And when I say that, I should also qualify to say that it's the speed at which the music is perhaps suggested to move, because if we don't have a metronome marking, and metronome markings do start creeping into the literature around the time of Beethoven, although there's some question as to whether his metronome markings were correct. Um, but this is where one aspect of interpretation comes in, 
And it's a particularly good reason to have a conductor on the podium because if all, oh, let's say 80 to 100 members of an orchestra were left to their own devices to establish a tempo, they would be in trouble, and we might think we were hearing Schoenberg rather than Haydn or Beethoven. <laughs> so, and we're gonna be talking about this in a short while. Um, so four movements each for the symphonies. This is the typical format. Allegro is the basic word for fast. That's the Italian for fast. Um, Conbrio for the first movement of the Beethoven means with fire or with energy. Um, first movement of the Dvorak is Allegro Maestoso, a majestic fast tempo, if you will. Um, second movement of the Beethoven Andante con moto. Andante simply means walking, a sort of walking tempo. Con moto means with movement. So already you can see with the con brio and the con moto for the first two movements of the Beethoven that there are various ways to qualify or further define the basic designation at the beginning. In the Dvorak we have as the second slow movement Poco Adagio. Adagio is a rather slow moving tempo. Poco means kind of somewhat Adagio. And again, we're very much in the realm of interpretation. The third movement and fourth movement of the Beethoven are both marked Allegro, meaning fast. The third movement of the Dvorak is called Scherzo. And that's a term that cropped up for this third movement dance slash character like form that actually first was used in, by Haydn in a string quartet of his, but came to be applied to symphonic third movements by Beethoven at a certain point. Vivace means lively or very fast. Um, both finales are allegro. So they're already, just in this small amount of information on the page, I think is a, very, a fairly clear sense of how a symphony in general will function. Now, in terms of a concerto, if you look up at the Mozart listening at the top of the page, um, we've got there Piano Concerto number 18 in B flat, K456. Now, this tells us a bunch of things. It might tell us that this was the 18th Piano Concerto that, be, that Mozart wrote, but it wasn't because there are some that are not numbered and things can get complicated in that way. But it's 18th in the chronological sequence of numbered concertos that we tend to experience. B flat is the key. K456 is the catalog number for a chronological listing of Mozart's works by a guy named Kirchel, K-O-M-L-C-H-E-L, so that's what that is. And the date I put there, 1784, that's when Mozart wrote the thing. Um, for the Beethoven and Dvorak, you see opus numbers. The word opus simply means work, and that term is used to specify the publication number of the work at hand so that Opus 67 of Beethoven was his 67th published work. Opus 70 of Dvorak, his seventh symphony, was his 70th pu published work. But another funny thing, is this all good so far? You all getting it? Yeah? Let me know when I confuse you. That's what I'm aiming toward. Um, <laughs> one thing that can happen, as we see in the Shostakovich Violin Concerto, is that we've got a piece that somehow has two opus numbers, and that's because when he composed it originally in 1948, he gave it the opus, the opus number 77 based on the number of works he had published to that date. But ultimately, he didn't release it for performance until 1955. It was then published in 1956, and when it was published, it was given the opus number, 19, opus number 99 because that's where the numerical sequence of Shostakovich's published works was by that point in 1956. And we actually know that Shostakovich himself would have preferred it to have been numbered 77 to place it correctly chronologically with the other works he was working on in the late 40s, but his publisher went with 99, and that's typically what one sees. And I see a hand suggesting a question. Is there a difference in the music itself between 77 and 99? Um, the question is, is there a difference in the music itself between the published Opus 77 and what Shostakovich originally, sorry, the published 99, and what Shostakovich originally completed as 77. To the best of our knowledge, there is not. Um, but I say with the best of our knowledge because we don't have source materials, and he may have been looking at it 
afterwards before finally releasing it for performance and publication. So yeah, so that's that. Um, another question, wow. Okay, the, the question is whether we should care about opus numbers because they, can tell, they may or may not tell us something about the chronological sequence of the works. I don't think we have to care about any of this. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's interesting, and when we encounter little things like this, they give us avenues for investigation or questioning, but ultimately, as I'm sure I've said before, it really comes down to listening to the music. And I think what can happen is that as we hear more music, learn more music, become more familiar with a wider range of works that have been produced by a given composer, it's fun to put, to put together these little details. And what I will say specifically about the Shostakovich Violin Concerto Number 1, since this question has come up in this context, is that the scherzo movement, the second movement of this Violin Concerto Number 1 of Shostakovich, uses very much the same materials as the scherzo movement of his Symphony Number no. 5, which was written around the same time. The scherzo movement of the Shostakovich First Violin Concerto has even on occasion been referred to as something of a study for the scherzo of the Shostakovich Symphony Number no. 5, but it's not clear to me that anyone who has suggested that has really managed to sort out the chronological aspect of which was composed when with respect to the other. But we can definitely say that, that the same sorts of materials, and it's very audible if you know both pieces, were used in the scherzo movements of both those works. Um, anything else anyone might want to interject or ask at this point? Yes. Um, the, the gentleman was pointing out that the scherzo movement of the Shostakovich Violin Concerto Number no. 1 is in second place. Typically, in a, sim a symphony, a four-movement symphony, the scherzo would be in third place. But the main point to make here with regard to both the Shostakovich and Britain Violin Concertos, as you see the movements listed on this sheet, is that both of them are quite unusual with regard to the sequencing of the movements. The traditional, if you will, sequence of concerto movements is evident if you look at the Mozart listings at the very top of the page. Typically in a concerto, we'll start with a moderately fast movement. The tempo can vary, but it's typically fast or moderately fast. So here we have an allegro vivace, which is a lively allegro, a lively fast movement. We then have Andante un poco sostenuto, which is a kind of walking tempo, a bit sustained. And then we finish up again here with an allegro vivace, a quick allegro. And so what we've got is the expected, if you will, fast, slow, fast sequence of concerto movements. Now, if you look at the Shostakovich, not only are the movements in a different order, but there are four of them rather than three. And this is an instance of a composer who has taken the idea of the concerto, but turned it into something somewhat different from his own perspective. And he's writing a piece here that's very much in his own language and of his own time. So what we've got in the Shostakovich is a moderately paced first movement, which he labels as a nocturne. We then have the scherzo, a quick character piece labeled Allegro. Then we have a Passacaglia. I'm going to come back to that later. And Larry is going to come back to that with me, in fact, um, because we'll be, we'll be hearing him use his instrument at, when we talk about that. That's an Andante, which is a sort of comfortable walking tempo. And then it finishes with an Allegro con brio, fast with fire that gets even faster at the end for a concluding presto section, which means presto, very quick. And he labels that a burlesque. So we have for the Shostakovich not just an unusual number of movements and an unusual sequence of speeds, but he has also given the movements names. For the Briton, we have a similar rethinking, if you will, of the standard form. So here, instead of going fast, slow, fast, we're going slow, fast, slow. Moderato con moto, a sort of moderate speed with motion for the first movement. Then vivace, very fast, 
lively for the middle movement, and then again a passacaglia to close things off. So in these two instances, we have 20th century composers offering their take on what a concerto can be, and of course it all harks back to the notion of the concerto as standardized, if you will, during the classical period by Mozart, continuing along with Beethoven. But I should point out, too, that concertos were not necessarily all following the norm, even during the 19th century. We have two piano concertos by Franz, Franz Liszt. Both of them are single movement concertos that last about 20 minutes each, divvied up into a bunch of sections. So even along the way, we can find deviations from the norm. And again, that's always something fun and interesting to discover because ultimately it's the kind of thing that adds further to our, out, to our knowledge of repertoire and how we can relate what we're hearing by one composer to music by another. Um, and I think with that, since I've gone on for quite a while at this point, the, the reason it occurred to me to ask Larry to join us for this session is because Larry is at least a triple threat and perhaps a quadruple threat. Um, he's a composer. He is a performer, as you know. As a performer, he can be both a concerto soloist and an orchestral player. So it occurred to me that it would be very interesting to have his take on what it's like to approach the notion of a concerto for all three of those perspectives. Have you conducted as well? Yes. Speak, I, speak I, into the microphone. You should be. I, I'm speaking into the, oh, I am speaking into the microphone. That good? Can you hear me? Yes. OK, so he is a quadruple threat, as I intimidated. And I think what I'd like to do is ask you, and he's smiling. He's, I mean, quadruple. He's happy to be a quadruple threat. And um, I think what I'll do now is let him talk to you a little bit and take questions from his perspective while I sort of plot out how I'm going to follow up what he has to say with musical examples from the different pieces that I have handy. Wow, well, well spoken, Mark. Wow. I, I learned a little bit today, more, more than a little bit today. And symphonies, yes, it, it's how to differentiate a symphony. In fact, um, as, as I tell my students sometimes, there comes a point where a symphony is less formal and it becomes, in a way, I mean, and some, with someone like Mahler, it, it, I, I, I can only call it a symphonic world. This is symphonic world number one because it's just, it's just his take and his view on a certain uh, set of emotions and, a, and an emotional landscape. and. And, and uh, that's because Mahler breaks, for instance, breaks all the, the old classical rules of symphonies, Ab absolutely. But as for concerti, well, <laughs> it's hard to tell because sometimes Brahms was so afraid of writing a symphony, he wrote um, two concerti that, that are basically symphonies with piano. I think they yes, both. and in fact, I should point out, since I was talking about the number of expected movements, that the second of Brahms's two piano concertos is actually in four movements. So you never know what's going to happen. Well, anyway, so shall I talk about myself for just a minute? Let's see, what have I done? Well, first of all, yeah, I'm a member of a great orchestra, a world-class orchestra, and, um, and we have world-class soloists. And so first of all, I'm a member of an ensemble that, that accompanies um, concerti, you know, con uh, these soloists in concerti. Like, I actually composed two, one for me and one for Tim Morrison, who was then principal of the Boston Pops. And, uh, um, just, I can't imagine, I mean, it's, it's an, an unimaginable thrill. Actually, I got, first of all, I got the piece off. I, got, I didn't have to rehearse it or play it. So I sat out in the audience and listened to John Williams conduct the Boston Pops Orchestra in a piece I composed with a great trumpet player. And, um, and I'm sitting at a table with, with John Williams' uh, great friend and great arranger, Billy May. And he, Billy May looks over at me and gives me a, squinch, a squinchy face and the thumbs up. And I'm thinking, I can, ab absolutely amazing. And um, well, well, just in terms of being a composer, there comes a point where you know you've arrived because uh, someone will say, okay, let's play the wolf. And, and you, you know, a comp a, your, your name turns into a noun. I mean, mine, mine, has, mine is anyway. <laughs> well, there are certain, but, but still. And let's see, what else have I done? Well, besides, a, yeah, there was a long time ago that I thought maybe there's, there's room for a, a studio orchestra in, in Boston. So I started the Boston Radio Orchestra and actually conducted it. Had, it was comprised of all my colleagues. Um, I turned out it was a fairly, I was a fairly good conductor, but terrible fundraiser. So it did. <laughs> and we leave the fundraising to the professionals here. It's where it should, it's where it should stay. 
And, um, but just the, the art of accompanying uh, a soloist. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm just, just speaking now as a performer, and I, I somehow think to myself, uh, you, you, if, you, if you're accompanying a soloist and you wait for that soloist to play, let's say you've got, you, um, I can almost do it better by holding a bass. I think I'll hold the bass and, and give you a one-man show for just a moment. Absolutely. Here's the, the, the opening of the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto. Sorry. I, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, how can I say? I'm a bit of a bass brat, which means I steal a lot of concerti from a lot of people. Cello concerto, viola concerti, violin concerto, but... <laughs> But hey, what I'm getting at is um, da 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 da. And so, as as the violin is playing that, um, we we somehow, if, for instance, if, if I if I do this, da 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 da. If I wait for the violinist to play before before I play, then and and if, if the entire Boston Symphony does that, we are. How can I say dead in the water? Truly, because I'll, we will we'll continue to slow down to stay together. Slow down, and and uh, and so what we have to do is something I describe to my students is just kind of extrapolate based on what what the soloist is doing there, or four score and seven years ago, and four score and seven years ago, and so we we have to imagine that this violinist is based on. So we, we, we figure that four, if, I, if, I, if I'm beginning to say four score in seven years, you know that a, the word ago is going to be here. So I play ago as if it's going to be there, hoping that the soloist is going to be there. If not, I'm, if I'm going to make a mistake or we, it's not going to be by much. And that's, it, there's, there's quite an art. In fact, um, um, there, there was one, one of our former assistant conductors, Julian Querty, who just has, has you know, it's gone on to bigger and better things if there is such a thing after the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Um, I mean, Julian was, was just a master accompanist. He had just that, that, that sixth sense of, of, of knowing that based on what he's hearing here now, this is what's going to, this is what's going to happen. And um, anyway, you wanted to talk about the Pasakaya, <laughs> didn't you? Are, are you trying to wrap up your comments at oh, this point? Um, don't count on it. Okay. No, no, no. I never do. I never do. Um, no, but this is this is a dialogue, and more, I, much as I have to say, this man has just as much to say, and I'm enjoying hearing him talk. Because I, th I thought what I would do next, if that does wrap up what you want to say about orchestral versus concerto perspective, if well, you will. Um, it's it's changed. It, 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 it simply just just as a as a composer will change the order the. the the expected order, um, the, the, the tempi, it, it'll change the way uh, a, a, the soloist is displayed with the orchestra, where in, in times past, it would be a simple, um, well, for instance, uh, you know, dum, da -da, da -dum, dum, ya -da 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 -dum. I mean, basically for the, for, for the entire, for that entire movement from Mozart, for the, the basses, the bass instruments are going, Do you always make that face? <laughs> <laughs> Only to you, Mark. Uh, yes, I knew that. I'm not done yet. There. Okay, now I've got the. <laughs> but and and so, and so very very often um, the, the the orchestra is truly just an accompanist. We we seldom get the tune. We may get a a, a a small a small dialogue going on, but most of the time it's the soloist in the center in the spotlight all the time. And of course that 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 chain that has changed considerably. Um, where, and there, there are dialogues, there are, um, well, of course, incredible cadences, uh, but um, I'm trying to think of other concerti, and Dvorak concerto, that's as much symphonic as it is soloist, mm -hmm. of course. Um, and of course, Shostakovich, an incredible example. Yep. But, but um, as, as composers develop, I mean, yes, and by the way, that the answer as to does it really matter what the opus number is? No, it matters that it's a work of substance by a substantial composer that you buy tickets to come here, here. 
Okay. Sorry, that, that was shameless, wasn't it? Uh, yes, but, but you did it, not I. Oh. <laughs> so, um, okay. Please, you. With that, yeah, I'm, yes, I'm going to jump in now. Please jump in. Um, what I'd like to do, actually, is come back to this notion of how we know a concerto is a concerto. Um, aside from the fact that we might know to begin with what piece we're expecting to hear. So what I want to do is go to another piece of music, which I will not identify. And I'm going to suggest that any of you who know the piece already, try to pretend that you don't. And I'm going to give you a beginning of the beginning of the piece without identifying it quite yet. And the question is, when this starts, how do we know what it is or what it might be? Any clues here that anyone might want to pick up on? Yeah, I'm not really expecting an answer to that question because until we actually hear a soloist come in, we have no specific reason to think that it's a piece, a concerto for orchestra and soloist. That was actually the very beginning of Mozart's wonderful piano concerto number 18 in B flat. Um, which will be coming up here in whatever program date is shown on your sheet. I don't have it in my head, but um, yeah, late November. And what we typically find in a Mozart concerto is the same form in the first movement as we would typically get in the first movement of one of his symphonies. And that is a specific reason why it might be hard to tell just what kind of piece it is, both in a classical symphonic first movement and in a classical concerto first movement, the composer is working in a scheme that later came to be labeled as sonata form. And all that tells us is that we have a succession of themes, one after another, that are typically contrasting in character. Um, they are set in certain key areas with regard to the home do, re, mi scale, if you will. I'm not going to get more technical than this, they work their way around in certain kinds of orders, sequences, and combinations in conjunction with changes of key and harmony to create tensions that are stronger or less strong at different points during the course of a movement. Ultimately, things come home, if you will, at a big statement of the main theme back from the beginning. And we again get some version of the sequence of themes before it all wraps up. Did that make reasonable sense? Somehow it seems to have. OK, good. And so again, the point that I want to make here is that we get that same scheme in the first movement of a classical concerto and in a classical symphony. And in this particular piece, we will finally know that it's a concerto. Of course, there is always a hint when we walk into the concert hall because it's spelled out in the program book for us. And chances are, if there's a piano in the front of the stage nestled within the orchestra, that's a good sign too. But the key point I want to make here is that there are certain schemes that our ear can pick up on. And this can happen, say, if we're listening to the, a recording or the radio that can clue us in to different kinds of things along the way. And if this were a radio, or given that it's a CD player, 
You don't know what that piece is necessarily, but I'm gonna let it continue a little bit farther along and then we will be clued in as to what's happening here. So there's the piano entrance in this first movement. It happens a bit over two minutes in. And in Mozart's day, when Mozart would have written these pieces for himself, one of the things that an audience would particularly have been listening for and looking forward to was what the piano was gonna do once the instrument entered. Because Mozart could do different kinds of things. He could give the pianist upon the pianist's entry the very same tune the orchestra started with to begin with, which is what he does here. He could give the, or the piano some sort of embellishment or figuration that would then lead into something that would combine the piano and the orchestra. He would on occasion give the orchestra an entirely new tune. So what the composer chooses to do in introducing the solo instrument, and this holds not just for piano concerto, but really for any kind of concerto, is one of the things that audiences listened for at the time the music was new, and it's also something we listen for today. Then as the first movement proceeds, we go through the sequence of thematic material set out in the orchestral exposition, and we just go from there. It's essentially all we need to know as a starting point, and then as we hear more of these pieces, we can again put together the kinds of information that we receive from different composers through different pieces and develop a cum cumulative body of knowledge that we can then carry with us into the concert hall or into the listening context of any sort. And this is how we grow as listeners and learn more about the music we're hearing. Um, very often in the slow movement of a Mozart piano concerto, we will again have the orchestra starting things off so I'm going to give you the beginning of the middle movement, the slow movement of this piece now. Mozart will do all sorts of wonderful things as this music continues. The pianist in this movement doesn't come in for about a minute and three quarters. So again, Mozart is setting the stage for the pianist with wonderful music. And one of the things always to be astonished by in Mozart's piano concertos is the way he uses the different parts of the orchestra, not just the way he uses orchestra versus piano, because he's got winds, woodwinds, strings, piano, and he can make these things interact in different kinds of ways, and that is one of the key bases on which he's able to be so creative and inventive as he moves from one concerto to another. So we have the different parts of the orchestra, we have the soloist in combination with the orchestra or parts of it, we have the thematic content, and in the case of Mozart, it all adds up to something that we can pretty often count on being able to label, label as sheer genius. Um, the last movement, as I mentioned, is the quickest moving music that we get. And typically in his last movements, which are very bouncy, it's the pianist that gets, who gets to start things off. So here's just a little bit of the opening of the last movement of this Mozart piano concerto.
unfortunately, it will be performed here in late November, so you can come back and hear the whole thing. <laughs> All right. Now, having said that, what I want to do is jump to the Addis piece that's listed last on your sheet, and then we'll be getting to the Pasacalia soon after that. Fear not. Fear not. Um, okay, the question was raised before, what does what I've shown of the Thomas Addis piece at the bottom of the list on the handout have to do with the notion of concerto? We see that the piece is called In Seven Days for Piano and Orchestra. The fact that it's labeled for piano and orchestra is essentially enough at least to suggest to us that this is a concerto type work. And in fact, it is. But what's also very interesting here is that unlike any of the other pieces, it has a name, In Seven Days. And what I will tell you is that In Seven Days refers to the creation story. So what we've got here is a bunch of movements, seven in all, that are keyed to the creation story in Genesis so that the first movement is labeled chaos, dark, light. Second movement, separation of the waters into sea and sky. Third movement, land, grass, trees. The fourth movement, stars, sun, moon. Then he takes a musical form called a fugue, which is based on repeated entries by different parts of the orchestra, different voices. Any of you who has sung row, row, row your boat, as a round knows the basic procedure from that, although fugues tend to get way more complicated, <laughs> so we'd be in a less good position to sing them. So what he has done is that he's actually linked the fifth and sixth movements as a fugal segment representing through music the creatures of the sky, sea and sky, creatures of the land, and then the final movement he gives the title contemplation. So what we have here is a piece that is a concerto with regard to the fact that it is a piece for soloist and orchestra, but at the same time, it carries us into the realm of program music, which is something that I think I've talked about here, but in a nutshell, program music is music that, simply put, carries some sort of extra musical connotation. And the examples of that that you're most likely to encounter frequently are, for example, Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony, in which he labels each of the movements with regard to a pastoral outdoor scene, although he himself made a point of saying that he wasn't telling a story in that piece. He was just providing musical impressions. But as we move later into the 19th century, we have the symphonic poems of Franz Liszt, which are based on literature, figures from folklore, that sort of thing. And we also have, in the late 19th and early 20th century, the great symphonic poems of Richard Strauss, which come up more repeatedly here. And they include things like Don Juan, Till Eulenspiegel's Merry Pranks, Don Quixote, Death and Transfiguration, also Sprach Zarathustra. So that, again, we're getting into a realm where composers are using music to convey a storyline, if you will, beyond the immediate scope of the notes themselves on the page. So we've got something like this in Addis's Seven Days. Addis is an extraordinary composer. Um, at the moment right now, his opera, The Tempest, based on Shakespeare, is having a run at the Met. He wrote it when he was only 32, or I should say he completed it when he was only 32. It had its premiere in London in 2004, was revived in 2007 when a recording was also made from it. It's had a number of other productions. I actually saw it at the Met this past Saturday night and liked it so much. I knew already that it's great music because I have the recording, but I'm going back again in a week and a half to hear it again. He's a truly amazing composer, some of whose music we've had here before. This is a piece we've not played before. It's quite extraordinary, and all I want to do here is give you just a small taste of it so you have some sense of what kind of sounds of music to anticipate. And with any great composer, one of the most striking things about Addis's music is his ability to write for the orchestra in what I think you will find to be a truly unique way. His music really sounds unlike anyone else's. And one of the things that I have found to be a useful way to characterize this 
based on the pieces I've heard of his, not just The Tempest, but purely orchestral pieces as well, is that he has this way of creating not just textures by musical lines and combinations of musical lines in different parts of the orchestra, but he also creates very frequently what I can best describe, I think, as musical auras by putting together combinations of sound that can not only vary in volume, but seem somehow to shimmer as he's varying the texture and dynamic range of the volume of the music as hand. So let me just, again, to give you a small sense of how this piece works and what his sound world is like, give you the beginning of the first movement. And what happens in this particular piece is that as in the Mozart Piano Concerto I was just talking about, the pianist does not come in immediately. So we cannot tell at the beginning whether this is intended to be purely orchestral or orchestra plus soloist or something else. The pianist actually doesn't come in for about three and a half minutes in this piece. And that lets Addis set the stage with his orchestral sound world, if you will, in a way that sets us up for what he's planning to do in terms of what we're hearing. And it also sets the stage for the pianist's entry. So here's the very beginning of Addis's in seven days. And again, he names this first movement, Chaos, Light, Dark. <laughs> And perhaps in the most, simplest, most simple sense, we can describe this music as giving an idea of bits and pieces of things somehow coming together, following from the chaos label to the start of the movement. What I'm going to do now is move the music ahead a bit so that you can hear the piano entry. Now, one problem with playing for you just selected examples from a piece that goes on for half an hour is that it can't possibly give you a sense of the cumulative line of the piece or the way it works as it proceeds from beginning to end. But what it can do, again, is give you a sense of the sound world that he's working with. And I'm going to give you just one other example, which I think is 
pretty well illustrative of his label at this point in the score. What I'm going to give you is the beginning of the fourth movement, which is stars. That movement is stars, sun, moon. And I think at the beginning of the fourth movement, you will hear a different kind of sounds as he's aiming up toward the sky, if you will, and also bringing in the piano in a way that gives the pianist a very different kind of music to play from what you heard at the beginning. So here's the start of the fourth movement, stars. Quite thrilled that we're having this piece coming up in just a couple of weeks, um, November 15, 16, 17. Again, he is one of the great composers of the day. I recommend his music very, very highly. And this is a piece that I think is accessible to anyone who is interested in the kinds of sound worlds that composers who are truly gifted can create. So with that, um, what I want to do is move on to Shostakovich, which is another of the reasons that I have Larry here with us tonight. And this will also let me focus a bit on the musical form of the Pasakalia that both Britain and Shostakovich opted to include in the context of their violin concertos. The Pasakalia is a form that goes back to the Baroque and Renaissance eras. And it's based in a repeated bass line that recurs over and over with other things happening around it. Um, for whatever reason, both Shostakovich and Benjamin Britten were drawn to the form, the scheme, the opportunities available to them within the notion of Pasakalia. And the Pasakalia in this violin concerto number one of Shostakovich, like the one in the violin concerto of Britain, gives us an instance of a composer really doing an incredible thing of taking a form that has been around for centuries and turning it to his own purpose, to his own use, in a way that sounds very much like the composer this composer happens to be, and also has an extraordinary cumulative effect as it moves along. Now, how many of you know the Brahms Fourth Symphony or have heard it? Some of you certainly have, and I think those of you who have that piece enough in your ear will know that in the last movement of his Fourth Symphony, Brahms, too, used the Pasakalia form by taking a series of chords introduced in the trombone setting them onto the bass line that repeats over and over, and then proceeding through a series of variations on that that grow more and more powerful as that music proceeds. So we have an anchor, if you will, to the notion of a later composer than a Renaissance or Baroque composer using a Pasakalia in the familiar example of Brahms. And here we have it in Shostakovich, as you're about to see. When the Shostakovich movement starts, the theme, the Pasakalia theme, this very big, extended, easy to recognize bass line, 
is given initially to the double basses of the orchestra along with the lower strings. And here is where Larry's presence comes in. Um, because what I'm going to do is let him play this bass line for you before I even move to the Shostakovich recording so you can hear what Shostakovich is able to do with this as the music proceeds. Just for your infor information, I, did, I counted measures. It's where, where the, the Brahms Passacaglia is eight bars long, this one is 17 bars long. Yes, so it, do, it, does, it does extend to some length. It's very interesting rhythmically in terms of which notes are held, where pauses come, when notes are repeated. So he builds a great deal into this single bass line, which sounds like this. Anyone want to hum that? <laughs> can I ask you to play it again? I'll bet I can. The question is, will you? Same volume, same volume. Now let's hear what Shostakovich does with this. And an interesting thing is that whereas some composers might opt to begin the piece or the movement with the bass line unaccompanied to get it into the listener's ear, Shostakovich immediately starts having things happening around it. So it is part of the basic texture from the beginning of the piece. It is very audible in the bass, even with other stuff going on, as it's being played by the low strings. And here is how it sounds at the start of this movement from the Shostakovich. Here is a thought. Want to risk playing along? <laughs> <laughs> 
And since Shostakovich has actually had other parts of the orchestra doing things around the bass line, we're essentially starting right in with a variation, if you will, rather than his giving us the bass line initially as a theme, if that makes sense. And what he does during the course of this movement is actually give us nine variations in which the bass line is taken up by different instruments as other parts of the orchestra do different things around it. And what I'm going to do now is play you just a couple of the variations that come along as this music proceeds so you get a sense of the different kinds of textures that Shostakovich can imply, um, uh, employ as the music moves along. So what I'm going to do now is move to the third variation in which the bass is again in low strings, but this is the point in the movement where the violin soloist, who is quiet, silent for the first two variations, finally joins in with a line of counterpoint against the theme. So this is variation three with the theme and the basses and the violinist, the solo violinist, coming in with a line of his own. Fix that because that was the end of it rather than the beginning of it. What's happening now is that the English horn and the bassoon are picking up the line from the violin that you heard in the excerpt that I just played. I'm going to jump a little bit further now to variation five because here what Shostakovich does is that he gives the bass line to the solo horn. So it takes on a completely different character in the middle of the orchestral texture. I think you can tell even with my choosing only selected variations to play that this music is building in intensity in a very wonderful and powerful way. I'm going to give you just one more of these variations. And what happens in this next variation I'm going to play for you, which is variation seven of the nine, is that it's actually the, the solo violinist who plays the Passacaglia bass line 
in octaves on the violin, giving it a completely different character. So here is this, and at this point, the solo violin is providing a different kind of intensity of his own. And just as a last example from this piece, I'm going to play you just the beginning of the final movement, which connects to this passacaglia by means of a long cadenza for the violin soloist. The, I think Larry mentioned the term cadenza before when he was talking about concertos in general. And a cadenza, for those of you who may not know the meaning of the word, is an extended solo passage for whatever instrumentalist is being spotlighted, featured in the context of the concerto. And what Shostakovich does in this piece is that from this very intense building Pasakalia, he moves into an extended cadenza, an extended solo passage for the violinist alone. And he uses that, and this cadenza here lasts about three and a half to four minutes. So it's big, hefty, wide-ranging, and he uses the cadenza as a, string, a springboard into the final movement of the piece, which, in keeping with our standard notion of concerto form, to come back to that, even though this piece is hardly a standard concerto, it leads us into the last movement, which is the quickest music that we will hear as this piece proceeds. And I just need to do a teeny bit of fast forwarding to get where I need to be. And as I said, this, this cadenza goes on for about three, three and a half minutes. And I will give you just the end of it. And the violinist, who has had plenty to do to this point, gets an, an additional workout through this last movement of the piece, where he pretty, mu pretty much has to keep up that pace without ever stopping. And it's an incredible piece. It's one of the pieces I'm most looking forward to this season. Um, and I'm not trying to sell it, but it is something I'm looking forward to. And that's going to be performed the end of January, beginning of February. The recording that I used, by the way, was a performance from April 2005 here with Kurt Mazur conducting the BSO and the Russian violinist Vadim Rapin. And for those of you curious about the other performances I was using, the Mozart was a Tanglewood performance from 2011 with the conductor Bernard Labadie with the BSO and the soloist Benedetto Lupo. 
the bit of Beethoven fifth that I gave you at the beginning was the BSO with Christoph bondach Nanyi conducting here in October 2007. And the excerpt from the excerpts from In Seven Days, the Addis piece, are from his own recording. He conducted on EMI with the pianist Nicholas Hodges and the London Symphony Orchestra. So that's what you've been hearing. Um, we have a few minutes left. I can take maybe one or two questions. And the first hand is here. Yeah, the, the question is, was the cadenza in the Shostakovich piece written by Shostakovich himself? Because during the classical period, pianists who were often the composers of these pieces would often improvise, as Mozart typically did, as Beethoven did, although we have cadenzas written out that were left by them for some of their pieces. In this instance, Shostakovich has written out the entire cadenza. It's fixed on the page and very much relevant to the piece as a whole because it includes a couple of references to other movements along the way and it actually also includes in it a musical signature that Shostakovich uses periodically and in fact he did it in this piece for the very first time. If we think of his name as D. Shostakovich with D, S being German notation for E flat, C and H, H being German notation for B natural. Do it again, please. Bum. That, that is a, a four note formulation that one hears in a number, thank you, Larry, of Shostakovich's pieces. As I just mentioned, he did it in this violin concerto for the very first time. He does it in a number of his string quartets and symphonies. And again, that is a way in which Shostakovich is literally putting his signature on this music, as well as spelling it out on the page. One more question, if there is one before we need to adjourn. Yes. So, uh, the Addis piece, Addis himself chose not to call this a concerto. Correct. Addis himself chose not to call this a concerto. And so what? Uh, yes, the question is, is, am I using the term concerto to apply to the Addis simply because it is for orchestra and a prominent soloist? The simplest answer is yes. Um, <laughs> and in fact, in the, notes, in the notes for the recording, it is referred to as a concerto. It would be absolutely typical these days to describe a piece like this as a concerto, even if the term is not used in the title. It's not surprising that it's not used, given that the intent of the piece is, to some extent, programmatic. So with pieces these days of this sort, we will sometimes see the name, the, the, the term concerto as part of the title, sometimes not, but certainly the implication is there for those, for those of us who want to place this kind of piece in the stream of history. So, and with that, we've run out of time. I'm, well, okay, I, I will yield and, yeah, it would be you, yes. You look disappointed, yeah. All right, last question. Sure. Ah, and yes, good point. Work. Yes, yes, yes. That, that's a very interesting point. There, there is a piece by Bella Bartok, which was actually premiered right here by the BSO and Symphony Hall in 1944. It's called Concerto for Orchestra. Bartok called it that quite specifically because he wanted to give the different sections of the orchestra an opportunity to show off as sections within the context of the whole piece. So in that piece, we have concerto-like sections, if you will, for the different parts of the orchestra as the piece proceeds. And the term, the, the title concerto for orchestra has also been used on numerous occasions subsequent to that by folks like Milton Babbitt and I, Elliot Carter wrote a Boston concerto specifically for the BSO. Ludoslavsky wrote a concerto for orchestra. And ultimately what happens is that we take the foundation in the classical notion of concerto and are able then to expand upon that with different kinds of music written over time by any number of different composers from various different places in different musical styles. Thanks again to Larry. Thank you all. Go have food.